Welcome back everyone, Alex Javaris here. In this video, I thought I'd show you another great exercise for learning about vibrant colour, painting roses. I'm going to be using the same extended palette I used in my previous video on how to achieve vibrant colours. If you haven't seen that video, I'll put a link in the description below. This is actually a shorter version of a full length demo I filmed as part of my Essentials of Colour course over on my Patreon channel. But because this is such a good exercise for learning about colour, it follows on quite nicely from my last video, so I thought I'd include a time lapse version on here. I'm also going to be approaching this a little differently to the way I was working in my previous video. Right, so after toning my canvas and mapping out the roses with a few simple lines, I'm next going to start lifting off some of the main light areas with some paper towel. Notice how I'm completely ignoring all the intricate petals and I'm reducing the subject into a few simple shapes. Once I've divided my subject into its main areas of light and dark, I'm then going to mass in the leaves just below the roses. I'm using a mixture of Viridian, Transparent Oxide Red and Ultramarine to match the colour of the shadows in the leaves, which is the darkest colour in this whole painting. Roses have really dark leaves. A mistake I often see students make is to paint the leaves with a bright green. Even the lighter leaves are probably darker than anything else in this painting. With the leaves massed in, I'm now mixing the first of my colours for the lights. This is going to be a really bright pink made with alizarin crimson and white, which I'm using for the light shape at the top of the middle rose, one of the brightest and most intense colours of this whole painting. Flowers are some of the most colourful subjects we have in nature. The lights on their petals are probably the most intense colours we're ever likely to encounter. And one of only a few places where you might use pure colour straight out of the tube. Right, here I'm mixing a less intense, more neutral version of pink, made by adding some yellow ochre and viridian. I'm using this more neutral pink for the light shape at the bottom of the middle rose. And here I'm mixing a really cool green white, made with titanium white, viridian and yellow ochre which I see right at the bottom of the middle rose. So there's a colour shift in the lights of these roses, from a really warm bright pink at the top to a really cool green white at the bottom. And I started by mixing the most obvious colour I could see, the really intense bright pink. I then mixed the more neutral colours by comparing them with the bright pink. Here, I'm just painting in the light shapes of the other pink rose on the right. I'm now mixing another really intense pink colour. But this is a much darker pink that I'm going to use for the shadows in the centre of the middle rose. The shadows of flowers can also have really intense colours. And just like with the lights, I've gone for the most intense colour I can see. Once again, I'm ignoring all the small lighter petals in the centre of the rose and I'm treating the whole area as a shadow mass. Here I'm mixing a greyer, more neutral version of my shadow colour by adding more yellow ochre and viridian which I'm using for the shadow at the bottom of the middle rose. With most paintings, I would normally start 
by blocking in my subject with just one colour for each of the main values. A colour for the lights and another for the shadows and so on. It's only after the blocking is complete and I have something recognisable as my subject that I would start looking for variations in colour within each of the main values. Also, with other subjects like portraits and landscapes, most of the colours will be much more neutral. So I would start by blocking in my subject with more neutral colours and I would then work towards the more intense saturated colour notes. But here, because the colours are so intense, I'm starting with the intense colours and working towards the more neutral. I'm also going for all the variation I can see within each of the main values immediately rather than blocking them in with just one colour. But even though I'm adding all these different colours, I'm still being really careful that they're the right value and they clearly belong to either the shadows or the lights. Next, I'm going to mix a colour for the background. I see this as a grey violet, which I'm making with ultramarine, alizarin, transparent oxide red to neutralise it, and white. I'll start by using the background to carve out the edge of the light petal at the top of the middle rose. This is one of the hardest edges of this whole painting, and it will draw the viewer's attention making the upper part of the middle rows the main centre of interest. So far in this painting, I've not been concerned with really precise drawing. I've been focusing on the different colours that I see. But now, as I block in the background, I'm starting to think about the placement of the hardest edges. We have some really hard edges made by the light petals against the background. At the top and bottom of the middle rows, the bottom of the pink rows on the left, and the top of the white rows. And they work together to form a triangle shape, which is really important for the overall design of the painting. Because of all their different petals, roses have a wide variety of soft and hard edges which along with their vibrant colour is another reason why painting them is such a great exercise. I'm now mixing a colour for the lights in the white rose. This is a warm white made with titanium white, cadmium yellow and a touch of viridian. But that's way too intense. So here I'm mixing a more neutral version made with yellow ochre. The colours in the white rose are much more neutral than the pink roses and there are some really subtle colour shifts. Here I'm mixing a colour for the shadows of the white rose. As well as this slightly warmer golden green, I also see a much cooler grey green and a few violet notes in the shadows too. I'm now using the background colour to define the edge of the translucent petals that run down the right side of the white rose. The edge down the left side of the rose is much softer. So here I'm painting some of the background colour into the shadow in a few places in order to lose the edge completely. Next, I'm blocking in the rest of the background. Once the background has been massed in, that's all of the larger shapes that make up this subject established and the blocking stage is complete. I'm now ready to start adding all the intricate petals and details to the roses. But before I can continue, I first need to clean my palette. It's completely covered in paint, so when I mix any new colours, they'll get mixed into what's already there and turn into mud. 
To avoid getting any of this mud on my work and to keep my colours nice and clean, I'll clean my palette every time it gets full up with paint, which will usually be several times during the painting. Right here, I'm mixing more of the bright pink for the lights on the middle rows. I'm then using my palette knife to place a really hard edge that I see down the left side of the middle rows. As I start adding the details, I need to be really careful that I don't end up painting every single intricate petal I can see. First of all, there are literally hundreds of them, so it would be impossible. But if I were to add too many petals, this image would lose its lifelike appearance. When we observe a scene in nature, we don't see all of the details simultaneously. We look at one area of detail at a time and all the other details fade from prominence. For our work to appear realistic, we need to be able to recreate this effect. So we need to be selective and figure out which are the most important details. Here, I'm placing a cool violet shadow which I can see in the light shape near the bottom of the middle rows. And here I'm using some alizarin crimson mixed with cadmium to place a really warm dark accent near the centre of the middle rows. A few dark accents like these can be used to define some of the smaller petals. And they convey the structure of the rows far more effectively than trying to paint all the tiny light petals. I'm now mixing a cooler violet colour, which I'm using for the really subtle reflected lights on the insides of some of the petals. And here I'm using the bright pink to paint one of the small light petals I can see within the shadow of the middle rose. So I've started by adding the most prominent details that I see. And I decide which these are by squinting. I squint down at my subject, then gradually open my eyes and put down the first detail that catches my eye. Sometimes that's all it needs, but often a little more detail will be needed before it looks finished. As I add more detail, I'll invariably end up adding too many and the image will start to look graphical like an illustration. So I'll have to dial the detail back again. There's usually quite a bit of toing and froing, adding details, then taking them out again before I achieve just the right level of detail for my image to hopefully appear lifelike. Here I'm mixing another cool grey violet colour, which I'm placing along the edges of some of the outer petals to soften them in a few places and add some variety. With all their petals, roses have a lot of intricate small shapes. This makes achieving the right level of detail particularly challenging. So painting roses is a great exercise for learning how to tackle subjects with a lot of complicated details. In fact, if you can paint convincing roses, I don't reckon there'll be many subjects that will be beyond your grasp. Once I'm happy with the middle rose, I'll start work on the other two. The middle rose is my main centre of interest, so I don't want the other roses to compete with it and have the same level of detail. With the pink rose on the right, I'm mainly focusing on the petal that sticks out on the far right, and I'm also adding a single dark accent and a light petal near the top. With the white rose, I'm adding a few details to the translucent petal that runs down its right side. 
Then I'm softening some of its other edges, particularly the edge of the shadow on the left, where I see it as almost completely lost against the background in a few places. As you can see, my palette is completely covered in colour. So here, once again, I'm scraping it back and cleaning it. And here, I'm mixing a colour for the lights in the leaves. Notice how the lights in the leaves are still actually quite dark. And I'm not trying to paint every single leaf. I am only focusing on the two hardest edges and I'm leaving everything else to the viewer's imagination. I'm now mixing a slightly lighter, warmer green, which I'm going to use to place the stem just under the middle rose. Here I'm mixing a much more intense violet colour. And I'm placing a few notes of more intense colour in the background to add some variation and make the grey a little more vibrant. Finally, after giving it some careful thought, I'm placing the finishing touches. Adding a few last details, like this tiny petal I can see in the shadow at the top of the white rose. Then I'm removing other details and softening a few more edges, which I find distracting. Remember, when painting, achieving a lifelike representation of what you see is more often about learning what to leave out rather than trying to paint every little thing you can see. So there it is, my painting of three roses. This is a really challenging exercise, so if you want to give this a go, before you try painting three or more roses, I recommend starting with just one, because you will find this difficult. But you will learn loads about painting details edge variety and working with really intense colours. And if you want to see exactly how I painted these roses, a full length version filmed in real time is available to watch over on my Patreon channel. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this video and found it interesting. Thanks for watching and good luck with your painting.